as I was seeking the Lord as to the message this week, I seemed to be drawing a blank, and then a story seemed to speak to my heart, and I still didn't seem to know what the point that God was wanting to make. It was clearly, and the more I prayed and thought about it, the more it seemed to form into a message. And this morning, as we went through the Sunday school, it's like, wow, what a matchup. You know, uh, in the Sunday school book, I made a couple notes here. We were talking about, it was also these times of crisis that forced Israel to choose to call out to God in faith or respond in unbelief by complaining and fault finding. And this morning I want to talk about an excuse to fail. It seems as though God always supplies that. Mm, yeah. And uh, it, we also talked about the fact that in Israel, discontent with present leadership, Moses opened the door for counter leadership. Yep. And uh, it seems that there is always an opportunity to fail if that's what you want to take. So as we talk about an excuse to fail, turn to 1 Samuel. Chapter 13, we'll read the first 14 verses. We're going to look at a number of passages of Scripture today where God seems to be supplying an excuse to fail. The question is, is that what you want to do? The question is, are you looking for that door? Are you looking for an excuse? Are you looking for a reason to implement your way because you found fault in God's way? In 1 Samuel 13, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines and the people were gathered together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth -Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Yeah, they were incredibly outnumbered. Then the people hid, did hid, hide themselves in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, after all, he was the leader, right? His son put him in a tight spot here. He was yet in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. There had evidently been an agreement when Samuel uh, anointed Saul that whenever there was a national crisis he was to repair to Gilgal and wait seven days for the people to gather to him and for Samuel to come and offer offerings to the Lord. That was to be the format from what we gather because the instruction was given two years previous to this and they had already done it once. So it wasn't just a one time thing. Uh, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. This is Paul, Saul's perspective right now. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, which was on the seventh day, right? Uh -huh. Behold, Samuel came the day that he was supposed to come. And Saul went out to meet him, and he, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, which is false, because there he was standing there on the last day. Uh, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. Well, that sounds real sanctified. And I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. <laughs> he had all the reasons. He had all his excuses lined up. It seemed so reasonable. 
You know, sometimes it's really hard to wait. God's way is not working for me right now. God's program is not meeting my needs at the moment. My situation is different. God's program is not what I need right now. You ever felt that way? Have you ever heard anybody say that? The question is, are you looking for an excuse to fail? You know, when I was a child, we'd often play hide and seek or cowboys and Indians or something like that. And it seemed to never fail. I would find a good hiding spot where they wouldn't see me or I could see them first and I'd be hiding and I'd be waiting and I'd be waiting. They must have forgot about me. They must have forgot what we were doing. They probably all went in and had lunch, left me out of here. I'd wait and wait and wait. And when I thought I cannot wait any longer, the moment I peeked my head up to look around, there they were. If I had waited just a little longer, I'd have had the advantage. But I gave myself away. It seemed like something, it, it was amazing. No matter how, I mean, okay, last time I waited this long, I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. And then you finally poke your head up and there it is. Should have waited longer yet. Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, I've come to a conclusion. I've got my reasons. This is logical. The Philistines will come down now upon me, and I've not made supplication unto the Lord. I've got spiritual reasons. I've got sanctified reasons. I forced myself, therefore. <clears throat> Sounds like Aaron saying, I put it in the fire, and now it came to this calf. I forced myself. So hard to wait. So hard to do it God's way. Seemed so reasonable to take things into his own hands. Until Samuel showed up. And then all of a sudden, everything looked different. Isn't that amazing how that happens? All of a sudden, uh oh, there's Samuel. Now all my reasons don't seem quite so smart anymore. Don't seem quite so solid anymore. And now I realize Samuel said to him, Thou hast done foolishly. Samuel said to Saul, verse 13, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. That's what it boiled down to. Yep. You did not keep the commandment of the Lord, and that's foolish. You failed. Well, I had good reasons. Yeah, God, God allowed you to be in a tight spot, and you felt like you had an excuse to, to set God's program aside. Okay, I'm going to take the wheel now. He said, you've done foolishly. And now listen to this. Have not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Oh, Saul, what did you lose? Because you chose the excuse to fail. What did you lose, Saul? But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. He did a lot of things right, but he had an excuse to fail. Saul had an idea in his mind how things should work, how things should look, how God should respond, how Samuel, his uh, spiritual leader, should respond. And when they didn't seem to be working the way he thought they should, he felt that gave him a right to step up and take charge. So subtle. He had reasons that were logical and reasonable to him. He assumed God would understand because the human authority over him seemed to have failed. So he figured he didn't have to keep rank. His case was unique, therefore others ought to obey God, but he was advanced above the people. Surely he had special entitlements. Does maturity and advancement mean that we don't need God's order and program as much? Or does maturity and advancement mean that we will be more faithful to God's program and order? Yes. Does being led of the Spirit give one rights and privileges to transgress God's Word? Or does being led of the Spirit make sure that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us? Amen. In 2 Kings 6, 26, we have another short story here. Jehoram, the son of Ahab. 
He is king. The, the city of Samaria is besieged. They are in great want. They are reaping the results of God's curses in Deuteronomy because of their disobedience and their rebellion. And God is waiting on Jehoram to break. He's waiting on Jehoram to humble himself. Jehoram thinks that he's waiting on God. But in reality, God is waiting on Jehoram. But Jehor listen, to, listen to what Jehoram says here. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, we're in verse 26, <laughs> chapter 6, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give me thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes. And he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. But now he has exposed it. Now he is exposed, he humbled before God in the sight of the people, which is what God was waiting for. Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Elisha evidently had promised him that if he would humble himself and wait upon God, that God would deliver. He decided, I've waited long enough. I've waited long enough, and therefore, I have a right to be angry at Elisha. I have a right to blame Elisha. But God was waiting until that sackcloth, which was hidden, became visible. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What, should I wait for the Lord any longer? What else are you going to do, Jehoram? You're going to surrender. Well, we're hungry. If we surrender, we could serve Ben-Hadad and our bellies would be filled. Looking for an excuse to fail? In reality, God was waiting on him. God had a purpose. God wanted them to humble themselves. Like we talked about, God wanted to humble the people. <clears throat> well, if you cooperate in that program, things will be a lot easier. If Jehoram had already broken and humbled himself, he'd never been in this fix to begin with, and he surely could have got out of it a lot quicker if he'd humbled himself and broken before God and had sackcloth upon him in the presence of the people and had everybody in the nation there with sackcloth before God. It wouldn't have taken near so long to get out of this mess. Exodus 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, it's amazing how delay, wait. You know, they didn't have water three days. How long are we going to wait on God, Moses? Moses, what's the matter with you? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make us gods which should go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto Jehovah. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the play there has to do with all kinds of dancing and immorality, uh, immodesty. It's not just, not just what we would think of as playing. Okay? It's not a church fellowship you know, uh, activities in the afternoon. That's not what we're talking about here. And the Lord said unto Moses, 
Go, get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, stiff-necked is not only stubborn, it is the arrogance and the pride behind the stubbornness. They think that because God is not doing it their way, that they have a right to implement their program. They think that their ideas are as good or better than God's. They demean and reject God's human order and authority because it's not meeting their needs at the moment. They think they can change God to fit their ideas and values. They think that God is up there to serve their cause and meet their needs. So, if that's what's happening, surely God is in it. And so we can fashion God to be what we want Him to be. Because after all, this Moses, you know, his, his idea of God's program isn't what we really want to do. So we're going to have our own idea of God's program. Happens all the time. God's commentary on it is in Acts 7.35 where Stephen says, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as to this Moses which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Oh, we like our program better. God's program wasn't working, so we thought we needed to jump in there and implement our program. You notice Stephen applies this that this Moses was a type of Christ. And just like the stone that the builders rejected the same as made the head of the corner, that happened in Moses' life, and it happened the same way in Christ. The one that they rejected and said, we will not have this man to reign over us, is the very man that God sent to be a savior and a deliverer to reign over them. Just like Moses. But when they both delayed to come down, the people forgot what they had taught and set up their own program. That's what we have today in America. That's what we have today worldwide. Because Jesus is not here. Because Jesus has been gone a long time. And we want not what has become of Him. Okay? So we are going to hijack Christianity. We're going to implement our own ideas and our own ways, our own programs, so that we can make this thing profitable. We can make this thing run smooth. We can gather big crowds. We can please the people. And after all, since Jesus isn't here, we've got to jump in and make this thing work. But when you redefine Jesus and make Jesus what you want Him to be, regardless of what it is, we want Jesus to be a pacifist. Or we want Jesus to be uh, sovereign in the sense of the Calvinist misinterpretation of the word. Or we want a Jesus that just accepts everybody and loves everybody. And you know, we want the Jesus that's all about just feeding the poor. We want the Jesus that eats and drinks with sinners. We want the Jesus that uh, accepts queers and, and doesn't mind immorality. He understands that we're just, you know, we're different. And he understands if I want to shack up with my girlfriend, he'll understand my case. Everybody wants their own Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same as this calf. Yep. They fashioned it like they wanted it. Right. And then they said, we're going to have a feast to the Lord. Right, that's right. God said they've corrupted themselves. Mm -hmm. Moses, he was in that mountain just a little too long. That gives us an excuse. Moses, did he delay? Moses ought to be here. Moses isn't doing it the way we think he ought to do it. We think Moses should be back by now. Therefore, we have a right to step in and take over. 
just looking for an excuse to fail. So many people are doing that today. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this. <clears throat> now, remember he's a type of Moses, right? If the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken up. <clears throat> therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. <clears throat> okay? The very instructions that he was left with. But, or he says, Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. <clears throat> but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming. So what? So what? Amen. So what? Oh, Moses, he delayed to come down out of the mouth. That gives us an excuse. Now we have a reason. We, we need this. This is a responsible thing to do. My Lord delayed this coming. So he begins to implement his own program. When he says, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken, that's just an example that includes all rebellion, all unfaithfulness, all deviations from Christ's actual commands. He's just giving it a story here. But the servant that says, my Lord delayeth his coming, therefore, I'm just going to implement my program. I'm going to start doing it my way. We're going to do what we think is smart. Well, God expects us to use our head, doesn't he? Yeah, he expects you to obey his word. Yeah. That's what he wants you to do with your head. <clears throat> he assumed the right to stop watching daily. He says, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. He was supposed to be watching daily for his master and doing as he had been told. <clears throat> but because he delayed, I'm not going to watch every day. I'm going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And he came in a day that he looked not for him in an hour that he was not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus knew that just the same way that those people found an excuse to fail when Moses delayed, he knew that someday many would find an excuse to fail when he delayed. That's what he's telling us. The same way that uh, the other stories, they found an excuse Saul found an excuse. Jehoram found an excuse. Why? Well, God took too long. God took too long. He wasn't doing it the way I thought he should do it. I had in my mind how this should work. And it's not working that way, so I'm going to take the reins now. It's the sin of the Pharisees. It's the sin of the scribes and Sadducees. Mark 7, he answered and said unto them, Well, as Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrites, as is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God that may keep your own tradition. Well, why? Well, it's been an awful long time since Malachi said that Messiah was coming. You know, we, we, we have in our minds what Judaism ought to look like. We have in our mind the things that we want to be here, the ingredients that we want, and therefore we're going to implement the rules and the laws and so forth so we can get the product that we want. <clears throat> so, that's what they did. And that's what people do today. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. It is a common thing for men to run on assumptions. I deal with it all the time in dealing and talking to people. It's amazing to me how people who can read English can read something and come up with such illogical conclusions that don't fit what they read. You know why? Recently, somebody gave someone one of my books. He said, you need to read this. The man just skimmed over it. I just, I just want to see what the basic arguments are. Assumed he knew, and then proceeded to answer. 
And his answers were so full of illogical foolishness. And then the, the guy sent the answers to me. He said, would you answer this? It's like, I've already answered every uh -huh. bit of this right. in the book if you'd have read it. Right. But the, what the problem is, the man did the same thing to my book that he does to the Bible. Right. That's okay? right. He skimmed the, I just want to see what the basic argument, oh yeah, I understand, I understand, yeah, now I know what God wants, and this, no, you don't know what God wants. That's right. You assume you knew what God, you know what you want, what Christianity looks like to you, or what you think Christianity, Christianity ought to do, what you think God ought to feel about this, and what you think God ought to think about that, and so you run on your assumptions instead of following the program. Right. They get a paradigm that they like. They envision, surely this is what God would want. And then they try to implement their program. And too often this deception is based on their pride. Their model opposes God's model. Too often this is based on their desires and not God's. Too often this is based on their values and not God's. Too often this is due to something they want. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We're having a feast to Jehovah. Their worship corresponded with their lust. Not hearing the word of the Lord, but assuming <laughs> they know what it means. Not listening to what Jesus said. So then they end up interpreting his words to be the exact opposite of what he said. Or they make him a liar. This guy, Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. So he interpreted it. The law and the prophets ended at John. <laughs> we're done. Over. Is that what Jesus said? No, that makes him a liar. Because uh -huh. Jesus continued to teach the Law and the Prophets. Right. The Apostles taught the Law and the Prophets. The purpose for the New Covenant was to write the Law in our hearts. The purpose for walking in the Spirit was that the righteous of the Law would be fulfilled in us. So he makes Jesus a liar because the Law and the Prophets did not end at John. The Law and the Prophets were our sole teacher and guide until John. Since that time the Kingdom of God is preached. Okay? But... Uh, this there's a new era breaking upon the earth, but it's not the it's not the undoing or the finishing or the completing of the law of God. It's the writing of that law in our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's the renewing of the sons of Levi, uh, twenty nine years after Pentecost, zealous of the law, thousands of them, and it was right. It was good. Yes. So they make Jesus a liar because they, they grab one little thing and they interpret it the way they want it to be. Yep. They want the law of God to be over with. Mm -hmm. The justification for their program is often the supposed faults of God's program. Well, I mean, if, if we can be a part of a government, what's going to happen if Christians on one side of one government start shooting at Christians in another government? Surely there's got to be a... That, so God doesn't want any Christians in government. You think you you think you found a flaw in God's program, so therefore I'm going to implement my program. Mm. Non-participation in government. Relegating the government to the realms of Satan's kingdom. That's only because you don't like God's program. That's right. You, you've, seen, you've seen faults and failures in men in God's program therefore I'm going to implement my program that's what's happened <clears throat> pacifism and the tenets of Marcionism demeaning God's laws demeaning Moses demeaning the apostles oh those apostles didn't, didn't understand what the kingdom Jesus talked to the apostles 40 days about the kingdom but they obviously didn't understand it we understand it. no what you're doing is you're not willing to submit to God's program you have something you like and you want to implement your program that's right. These pastorless churches and standardless churches. Oh, well, we saw a pastor who abused his position. I saw a member that abused their position, too. Uh, so should we have memberless churches, Come too? On. Amen. No, the problem is you had a, saw a supposed flaw in God's program. There was something in God's program that you didn't like, so you're going to implement your program. Yeah. 
The rejection of the necessity of the local church program in one's life. Well, all those people at that church are hypocrites, so I don't think church is a necessity. No, you just want to implement your program. You don't want church to be a necessity. You don't want to have to be a part of a church. You don't want to have to get along. You don't want to have to submit. You don't want to have to work together. You don't want accountability. So now church is not a necessity in God's program. No, that's your program. That's right. Rejection of church authority and the need for respect and obedience. The rejection of parental authority and respect. Oh, well, my mom and dad, they aren't perfect, so therefore I'm going to implement my program. It all comes from this root of arrogance against God's order and program. It all comes from the love of my own ways and ideas. 2 Samuel 15, 2, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See... Thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. I see a fault in my father's program. I see a fault in God's order. Oh, that I were made judge in the land. I, my program would work better. Are we just looking for an excuse to implement our own program? Are we looking for flaws in God's way so we can justify our own? Or are we looking to justify and implement God's ways? There's a big difference there. <clears throat> 2 Peter 3, 3, Knowing this first, that there should come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? What does that mean? He should have been here by now. Yeah. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Why? They have their own program. That's right. And I don't feel good, I just don't feel right about implementing my program until I have thoroughly faulted his program. Uh -huh. Until I have found fault with the pastor, or fault with the people, or fault with father, or fault with mother, or fault with the government, or fault with whatever order God has. When I find fault with that, then I feel justified. Uh -huh. Well, I'll, I'll just step up and implement my program. Uh -huh. Subtle rebellion. Yep. Deceitful. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness. And just about the time you're done implementing your program, He's going to show up. Mm. And then you're going to see the foolishness of your way. Yeah. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jude adds, after reading 2 Peter, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves from God's program, sensual, having not the Spirit. Sensual, living after their own assumed wisdom and rejecting God's clear word and program. Okay? They separate themselves from God's program so they can implement their program because they're running on their senses and not the Spirit of God. Right. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God from which they have separated themselves, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I want to say in closing, patience is a key ingredient in faithfulness. Patience is a key ingredient in faithfulness. I don't know about you, but I daily feel my lack thereof. Patience in suffering for truth is a key ingredient in the love of truth. Patience in waiting for Christ is a key ingredient in trusting His Word. Patience in faithfully working God's program according to God's Word is the prime indicator of love for God and His law. 
Luke 8, 15, But they that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. You know what patience is? Patience means I'm not looking... Listen. Patience means I'm not looking for an excuse to fail. Yeah. Patience means I'm not looking for an excuse to do it my way. I'm not looking for flaws and faults so I can implement my program. Patience means... I am determined to follow through with God's program. Luke 21, 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Hebrews 6, 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 10, 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Hebrews 12.1 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. James 1.3 Knowing this is the trying of your faith, worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. You may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. James 5, 10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have suffered in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. We've been reading through Jeremiah. There's a good example. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord's all over? All done? Gone? No. The goal, the purpose of the Lord. That's what it means when it talks about Christ as the end of the law. Right. Okay? Ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I fear that many people are looking for an excuse to fail. You say, Brother Mark, that seems so ludicrous. I know. But I've just given you many examples of it. Mm -hmm. Jesus warned of that very thing. My Lord delayed this coming. Oh, I got an excuse. <clears throat> I'm justified. So now I'm going to go fail. Samuel, Samuel was late. Oh, he didn't, this is the seventh day. He should have been here by this time. He came probably two hours later. He was there on the seventh day. He was there within the appointed time. But he wasn't there the way Saul thought he should be there. So, I've got a reason. Now I can do it my way. God's delay is usually the key for them to forsake God's program and implement their own. Look at, look at the Exodus we talked about. <coughs> Whenever there is delay, whenever it seems like God is taking too long, I can't wait any longer. The Philistines are going to come and get me. I'm going to die of thirst. I'm in a bad spot. Now, Saul was in a very tough spot. They were, he was totally out. He was going to get wiped out. So, now we'll make God mad. That'll help. Yeah. <clears throat> what you need to do when it seems like you're in God's waiting room and it's just getting a long time I think it ought to be over by now I think he should have showed up by now I think the answer should have come by now I want you to do a couple things number one ask yourself is God waiting on me Is God waiting on me? Number two, am I doing all that God has told me to do? Have I humbled myself before Him to the dust? Have I broken before Him so that this test need not go any further if that's what it's all about? If I'm doing all that God has told me to do, then I need to wait. 
I'm learning patience. Waiting may include fasting, praying, suffering, working, obeying. Psalm 27, 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, 34, Wait on the Lord and keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. The people thought they were going to die in the wilderness. Saul thought he was going to die. Jehoram thought they were going to die. <clears throat> the people at Mount Sinai, we want not what has become of this Moses. Moses must be gone. We've, we've got to step in and do something. We've got, to, we've got to take responsibility here. Don't look for an excuse to fail. Look for a reason to wait. Get in the Word. That we, through the comfort, the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Get in the Word and bolster your patience and your hope. Building yourself up on their most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. The devil would like to help you find an excuse to fail. When you're in great need and it seems like everything's falling down around you, making God upset is not going to help. Forsaking His program is not going to help. Taking the wheel is not going to help. You don't know what you'll lose when you do that. Look what Saul lost. He couldn't even, he couldn't even comprehend what he lost. Had he passed that test and continued faithful to God, Jesus would not be the son of David. He'd be the son of Saul. That's right. Jonathan would have been on the throne a great and mighty king. He robbed his own son of being king because of his impatience. Let's stand together. This isn't the message I began to develop when I looked at these verses. It just seemed to develop before me. It seemed to be what God wanted to say this morning, and it was I just kind of had to keep saying, okay, where are we going? What, what, what's the point, Lord? What, what is it that you're wanting to say to your people? And as I began to continue to pray and to read, it seemed like this idea came through. I believe someone in here, if not all of us in here, need this. Amen. Don't, don't look for that door, that excuse to fail. Any thoughts from the brethren before we pray? It stood out to me that in that moment of crisis, the seeming solution of taking over yourself usually ends up destroying the very means of your deliverance. Exactly. Um, let's kill Elisha. Like, in reality, how would that help? Elisha is a means through which your deliverance is going to come. Right. Or let's, let's do something else that would be foolish like that. And it's like, reject Moses. It's like, no, Moses is the one who's trained to lead you to Canaan. Right. You'll not make it there if you don't have him. And yet, at the at the moment, it seems like the logical choice to make. Although, when you step back farther from the situation and look at it more honestly, it's like, don't do it. Our prize. That's, that's the problem. We become so wrapped up in the feelings of the moment, mm -hmm. that we can't think straight. Mm -hmm. And our pride deceives us. And that's why I call it an excuse to fail. Our pride deceives us into destroying our only hope of deliverance, thinking that we're solving the problem. I think another mistake we can make is, um, you know, when we have a failure and we realize we, we go to God for it, whether it's repentance or whatever, it needs to be done that we don't justify and say, well, that was a little failure. 
and like overlook failures because in that those little failures can become real big failures can become where you throw in the tower I mean you can get to that point so I guess we should acknowledge any any kind of type of failure that we can and take care of it right then question is how much do you want to lose right. every time you fail you lose right. you lose something exactly. well warning too we don't have to verbally say the Lord delayeth is coming so therefore I'm doing this an indication that you are processing that or thinking that even subconsciously is what you're doing right so don't think just because oh I didn't say that doesn't mean you're not in that situation right. are you implementing your program well then that, right. that proves it right there let's pray